Brantford, Ontario, located about 100 kilometers southwest of Toronto on the picturesque Grand River. It's nicknamed Telephone City because Alexander Graham Bell settled here in the 1870s with his family as he worked on his world-changing invention. His old homestead is now a museum. But there's no doubt that Brantford's biggest claim to fame is that this is where the NHL's biggest superstar, the Great One, was born and raised. Wayne Gretzky's name and tributes to him are everywhere in the city, with sports centres and streets named after him. When Wayne was growing up here, Brantford was little more than a town, but today it's growing. While the sign on the highway says population 98,000, it is quickly becoming a big city. Right now it's really about growth and managing growth and change because we're right on the periphery of the, the greater Toronto area, which is one of the fastest growing areas in North America. And, and people here are very concerned. We want to accommodate the growth. We want all the opportunities that growth provides to us, but we want to change the essence of our city. It's a double-edged sword. It's a double-edged sword. Politically, Brantford Brant is certainly a riding to watch. While Brantford is at its center, the riding includes numerous other small towns like Paris and Burford, thousands of acres of farmland, and Canada's most populous reserve, Six Nations of the Grand River, with close to 13,000 residents. Voters have shown strong loyalty to all three major parties over the years. The city of Brantford. The popular conservative Phil McCollman has represented the riding since 2008. He is retiring, but a conservative replacement is anything but a foregone conclusion. Before McCollman, the riding was liberal for 15 years. Increased emphasis is being placed on Massey Ferguson's major product line. And prior to that, dating back to the 1970s when it was a manufacturing town, the NDP held the riding for 22 years. All parties know this will be a horse race. Larry Brock, Conservative candidate, thank you. Larry Brock is running for the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada. Hello, ma'am. He has lived his whole life in Brantford. You got our vote. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. We met him canvassing at the Brantford Farmer's Market with his family and other volunteers. Smile, smile, smile. Okay. He's been a lawyer for close to 30 years and an assistant crown attorney for 18. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, so I'm going to try your kibasa. But has also spent many years working behind the scenes for the Conservatives. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I haven't seen him in ages yeah, either. Seen quite a bit, eh? Including helping the man he hopes to replace on three of his successful campaigns. Yeah, so are you feeling confident? Extremely confident, extremely buoyed with the uh, amazing team that I have put together. When Larry Brock decided to run in January, he quickly shed 55 pounds. He said he wanted to be in good shape for the race. He's been out canvassing for weeks, even before the election call. I'm hearing a lot of concerning things at the door. Obviously, the most pressing thing is the issue regarding the economy. Brock admits Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole has suffered from a lack of name recognition. He says that began to change the moment the election started. It's changed literally, Pam, in the last five days. The pandemic has prevented Mr. O'Toole from really highlighting his abilities to unite Canada to think about us as a collective unit, not to divide this country into East versus West, into religious groups. We are talking about a United, United Conservative Party and a United Canada. So literally in the last five days, Pam, I have heard a change. Oh, Mr. O'Toole said this. I'm glad Mr. O'Toole addressed that. So the message is starting to resonate yes. on a more daily basis. The Six Nations Reserve is a 46,000-acre territory located on the banks of the Grand River and bordering the city of Brantford. We headed to the community of Oshwiken on the reserve to a favourite breakfast spot for Liberal candidate and band member Alison MacDonald and her mother Marion. Like Larry Brock, Alison MacDonald is also a lawyer. She's worked on behalf of vulnerable families for many years. Alison decided quite suddenly to throw her hat in the ring to the surprise of her mother. I was not even aware she was going to run for election. It came as a complete surprise to me. It, so after the fact you found out? Yeah. <laughs> she made a decision all on her own and I thought this was really super. 
Marianne MacDonald grew up on the reserve, but when she married a non-native man, she lost her indigenous status and was forced to move away. She fought to regain her status many years later and moved back. Are you regulars? Because my mom's a regular, yeah. right? Yeah. As a result, Allison feels like she brings a unique perspective to the issues facing her community and the riding as a whole. Really what I want in terms of, you know, the reserve is I want people to go vote. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She grew up outside the reserve, but has always yeah, been right, connected yeah, yeah. to it. I straddle two worlds. So I am, obviously, I'm a band member of Six Nations. I've been grounded in this entire area for my whole life. My mom's family is on the reserve and from the reserve. And I think it's the time now where we really need a person from both worlds. We need that balance. Uh, this riding needs that balance, and I can bring it. I mean, we've had a history if you look at Medicare. The NDP candidate for Brantford Brant is Adrian Roberts. How are you? She's a longtime school teacher and union activist. I'm your NDP candidate for Brantford Brant. She says she felt compelled to run after hearing so many of her teenage students express a gloomy outlook about the future. Hearing youth speak of hopelessness as an educator, where my entire lens is always about youth and what's good for them, it, it broke my heart. And, it, you know, I realized we need some changes here. We've got some pretty good candidates here. They've all got at least some profile. And it, so, yeah, it'll be, it'll be a good election. People are going to have to, whoever wins this riding is really going to have to earn the vote. For the first time, we have a contested or a, an election where there's no incumbent. And right. that's the key thing. So. Will it be Liberal? Will it be Conservative? Will it be NDP? All three have represented this riding at some point in the last, since I've been here over the last 30 years. Yes. Vincent Ball is a longtime reporter with the Brantford Expositor. He thinks this is going to be a very interesting race. He won't make any predictions about Trudeau's chances of winning his coveted majority. We'll invest nine billion dollars. To but he believes the PM wants and needs a win here and will be working hard for it. I would be very surprised if he didn't come to Brantford. First of all, we have the um, Woodland Cultural Centre and the Mohawk Institute. So if there's a reason for him to come here, he may decide to come here and announce how much money will be coming to this area to uh, search for unmarked graves on those properties. Um, that would be a reason for him to come here. Uh, also, it's a contested riding. He's got a good candidate. That may help put it over the top. There are many issues facing voters here in Brantford Brant. One of them is front and center across the country this election, and that is the need to address the atrocities suffered by Indigenous children at residential schools. Brantford is no exception. This is the former Mohawk Institute, one of the oldest and longest running residential schools in the country. Now this property is home to the Woodland Cultural Center. It's also a memorial filled with shoes, teddy bears, flowers and messages to the victims. We still have, you know, high rates of poverty. We still have, you know, education issues, language and culture that needs for the revitalization. Six Nations Chief Mark Hill says there's real fear that, like elsewhere in the country, there are unmarked graves on this site and others where the school used to stand. And that a search must take place. He says he doesn't support one political party over another and that while conversations with the federal government have been productive, survivors of the Mohawk Institute are pushing ahead with a criminal investigation. You know, we're not prepared to go down commemoration lane, um, you know, just due to the fact that we don't have the answers that we need. Um, and so we're, we're now embarking on this journey of a criminal investigation to search the entire grounds uh, on and around the property of Mohawk Institute. Uh, one, again, so that we can see uh, justice for, for all of those lost children uh, who were never able to make it home. Uh, and two, to hold someone or something uh, accountable for the, the actions and the atrocities that, that were committed uh, during you know, such a, the, this, this dark history of, of Canada's history. So what do you think your chances are here? I feel really optimistic about this race. We have no incumbent in this riding. There is a fourth candidate on the ticket in Brantford Brant. Like his Liberal opponent, 26-year-old Cole Squire is also Indigenous. Well, it's winning, that's totally it. 
To have two indigenous people running federally is something Chief Mark Hill believes is unprecedented. Uh, it's exciting uh, to see we actually have two of our community members who are candidates. Squire is the acclaimed candidate for the right-wing People's Party of Canada. A seemingly unusual alliance for somebody of his background, but he disagrees, saying the party is misunderstood. How do people react when you tell them that you're running for the People's Party of Canada? Well, the same way they react when I've also spoke out about lockdowns and whatnot. The prevalent message in Canada is if you're speaking out against these things, if you're advocating for nationalism or populism, they unfortunately will refer to you as a white supremacist or something along those lines. So myself being a Native American, I, I always get a chuckle out of that for sure. And, and even my campaign team, we're, we, we're so diverse. We don't judge people by their religious ideologies, what their ethnicity is, what their gender is like that. We're just proud Canadians who are ready to step up to the plate and fight for our fundamental rights and freedoms in Canada. Some Indigenous voters feel resentment towards the Trudeau government that goes beyond residential schools. I have two passions in life, language and food. Nakwa teaches the Mohawk language. I don't know. <laughs> He's also the sous chef at an Indigenous fusion restaurant in Oshwikan on the reserve. He has harsh criticism for Trudeau's handling of the ongoing land dispute between the Six Nations and the Canadian government in nearby Caledonia. No! No way! Have you been disappointed by the current federal government? Yes. How so? Well, the way that they're uh, trying to bully us into uh, submission and trying to intimidate us and against standing up for our own rights, for our own land. Uh, I, I, I dislike the way that they've handled it in the last couple of years. We are not a violent people, you know, and um, it just goes to show that the, the Liberals are basically a bunch of hypocrites, you know, um, and one moment they want reconciliation, but in the next moment they're sending in the police to harm and, and injure our people, our women too. There's women that were uh, harmed and injured during the whole melee that happened down in Caledonia. and like. I, I just think it's extremely hypocritical. Tell me who you will be supporting. Uh, Jagmeet Singh. You see the kids like grow up. See them grow up. Alison McDonald is confident that her connection to the community, along with work as a family law litigator, make her the best person for the job. You need somebody that can be down to earth as well mm -hmm. and feel you can identify with and talk to. And having worked with many different, obviously, many different people, all different ages, but particularly those vulnerable people and having to connect with them, those are the ones that need the most help. And they're the ones who need a voice. And I definitely am ready and prepared to do that for anyone who wants to be heard. Another major issue in the city of Brantford's downtown is the opioid crisis. The council has asked the federal government to declare the opioid crisis a national health issue. That's how severe it is. We just had three overdoses um, two blocks away from here last night. A lot of the issues we have here, though, are, are common throughout the country. And, and one would be the, the opioid epidemic. None of us, no community in Canada is exempt from it. Uh, my, my wish is that the national government had a more robust national opioid strategy. As Mayor Kevin Davis is painfully aware of the frightening numbers. Brantford has for several years been far above the provincial average when it comes to opioid overdoses and deaths. He also knows how difficult it can be for municipalities to deal with the issue without financial help. What I'd like to see the federal government do is um, realistically decriminalize all drugs. Really? You know, stop the war on people who use drugs. Also, um, more access to safe supply. Uh, I know the, uh, the Liberal government is offering that. Um, the problem is doctors aren't willing to do it. Randy Roberts founded an organization called Brantford Substance Users Network after his wife, Dawn Wyatt, died of a fentanyl overdose. He felt it was so important to offer help to addicts in downtown Brantford, where he says there are few services, that he's opened his own apartment as a de facto shelter where people can show up any time of the day or night for naloxone or a safe needle exchange. And that's the, when I'm the busiest. It's between 10 and 4 in the morning. And right. there's no services throughout the city between after 8 p.m. Right. Never mind harm reduction supplies. Yeah. Brantford is... Uh, 
I'd like to say a decade, but probably two decades behind in harm reduction services. The addiction crisis is also top of mind for all three main candidates, as well as the acute need for affordable housing. One of the issues I think right now for a lot of people is going to be affordable housing. And it's, it's a local issue, but it's also, I think, a federal issue. The city council voted to sell a, a municipal asset a golf course to raise money to pay for affordable housing. They did not want to wait for the upper levels of government to come through with money for affordable housing. So that would, I would think, would be an issue. I, I would think that most of your municipal leaders here would say, where's the money for affordable housing in these platforms? The housing crisis crisscrosses the country, and Brantford Brant is no exception. The situation here is described as dire. There's increasing homelessness in downtown Brantford due to the pandemic, with few options for subsidized housing. And for those hoping to buy, while real estate prices are still lower in this region compared to Toronto, they are rising rapidly. The benchmark price for a home in Brantford was $633,000 in July, a 36% increase over a year ago. All the major parties say they have a plan to fix the problem. The Liberals committed to creating affordable housing in their last budget. The Conservatives' platform says they'll build a million homes over three years. The NDP says it'll build 500,000 affordable homes over 10 years. For voters, it keeps coming up as a key election issue. The housing is terrible. With our, like our son and, our, and his girlfriend, they've been trying to find a house, and it's just way out of their price range. Yeah. So they just packed up and moved, they, they bought a house in Alberta because Ontario was just like way out of their price range. If you talk to some young people, their viewpoint is distressingly pessimistic. And it's not just the exorbitant house prices. These two young women are bright, engaged people whom you would expect to be excited about the future. But the opposite is true. Do you feel hopeful for the future? Uh, that's debatable right now. Um, I went to school for environmental studies, so with climate change and everything going on in the UN announcing that, well, we're past like the breaking point for the earth, I'm not very hopeful in that sense. And then just going back to the smaller picture of like moving out in the future and housing and stuff, I graduated last year and I've been applying for jobs like crazy and I still haven't got anything. Yeah, I don't mean to sound like negative, but I'm just trying to be realistic about the future and it's just not, I don't see it as all that positive. That's a really hard question to answer. Um, with the pandemic, everyone I know is like riddled with mental illness, uh, which is, you know, another layer on top of the fact that no one thinks they're going to be able to afford a house. Um, and I've done a lot of work to try to like, you know, invest in my own future, but in ways that I've like invested in interpersonal relationships because I don't think that I'll be able to find like employment that like I, I'm able to invest my life in and feel like mm -hmm. like it's like work that I'm I, I'm happy doing work that is meaningful to me I, I don't think that is something I'm going to be able to do their anxiety stems in part from their growing sense that the pandemic is far from over I and everyone I know I'm so tired and I'm still so scared um mm. I'm sorry it's okay Hazel I'm sorry how can you make young people feel more hopeful? You know, listening. I think a lot of young people uh, often feel ignored and that um, they're, what they're passionate and caring about is pushed to the side. So, you know, a lot of youth are talking about climate change. They are not hopeful about the state of the planet, and rightly so. You know, we've seen the reports come out. We are in a dire situation right now. There, th we do have a platform for housing. You know, we have an opportunity for a better affordability with an NDP government that will give them that hope that I had as a child. In the rest of the county, there are other issues to contend with. Farming and agriculture is still the primary industry in Brant County, but there's concern that rich farmland is being snapped up, either for development or mining. Are you worried about the future of farming in this area? 100%. Jane Van Acker owns a farm and runs a vegetable and fruit market in Burford. I actually go and I speak to the farmer. And says it's getting harder and harder to make a living farming. If some developer dangles a carrot, it's hard to resist. Why would you not sell your farm? 
somebody's going to pay you three to ten million dollars for some farmland so you can develop a subdivision or somebody wants to develop the subdivision we're all here because we need to earn an income and we need to live yeah. and um that's an opportunity and it's a financial opportunity does the farmer really want to do that maybe not deep down a farmer is a farmer Paris is one example of a town that is experiencing rapid growth. Many acres of prime farmland have been lost to housing developments with thousands of homes. The county mayor says he doesn't agree with the way that was done. It's just an adjustment period right now. But says all in all, the outcome is positive. We're actually a very good news story in the county of Brant. We're growing leaps and bounds. We're mandated to double our population, which we have in the pipe now with, I think, 5,700 houses. Bailey says these building decisions were made before he became mayor, and going forward, the official plan is more circumspect. The loss of agricultural land is... Is real, and it did happen, but it hasn't happened um, since this term of council. Oh, right. Yeah, and, and again, nobody's fault. I think, it was, I think when someone offers you development and money, and a future and just a little bit of everything, to, the opportunity to grow, it sounds wonderful until you see 4,000 houses being built on one road, then it's scary. Paris was the prettiest town in Ontario. It is no longer that in the, the new suburbans that are happening, yes. Garth Potruff has grown up in the county on a farm. I think accepting change is a big part of it too. He has owned Grand River Rafting for 16 years. So welcome guys. First time here? Yeah. A successful business that sees close to 50,000 guests every year. And most Canadians don't know it. This river won the international award as the best managed river in the entire world. He's dismayed by the extent of development in the area, but admits he and his sisters sold their own 100 acres to a gravel company for $6 million. Yeah, it's a perfect one for first time. Yeah. It is concerning because you can never replace the land. And, and coming from a farm background myself, it is. I also understand change does happen. While Potruff's business was not negatively impacted by the pandemic, he is critical of the federal government's handling of it. You guys got drinking water? What COVID has shown is a real lack of sensitivity to the tourism business. And what people don't understand is that if a town doesn't have a tourism attraction, there's no reason to come to that town. And that has not really kicked in in, with uh, understanding from the present government that's in position right now. They've, they've done some things, but it's been too late. You know, it's, it's, the, the horse has already left the barn. And it's unfortunate because so many small companies just could not survive by the time the, the uh, government decided to do something. Mm -hmm. So it's actually been very detrimental. Sounds like you've been a little bit disappointed with the Liberals' track record so far. Yes, I have. I, I think their reaction is like watching pouring molasses off a spoon. It just doesn't land fast enough. Oh. Yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. Other small business owners disagree. At the charming Wincy Mills in Paris, there are about a dozen vendors who got shut down last December. We have been very lucky to use... Ruth Hernandez and her husband, PJ Parasic, had only opened two weeks before. They depended on the federal government's financial help to get them through. And they say Trudeau will get rewarded for that at the ballot box. How important were those grants? Well, that was, honestly, it was pretty much everything. I think he would get our vote, to be yeah. honest. Uh, if you ask me, I think he did okay. I'm pretty happy. Yeah. We're still here. We get fifteen fifty a month. Yes. That's it. Not so, so these seniors. Yeah, big, big sure. anger Especially about Mr. with Mr. the low-income people. Yeah. Because yeah. we need housing like crazy. And, and the seniors, they forget about us yeah. seniors. Big time. I'm 73. I saw a lot of changes, yeah. and not for the good. Yeah. Not yeah. for the good at all. You Everything. Pay been... for everything yourself. Yeah. When I bought this, I had to pay for this myself. Yeah. Five thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. That was too bad. Eh? Yes. Speaking of paying for things, Larry Brock echoes his leader's position that while the financial assistance offered by the Liberals during the pandemic was needed, it must come to an end. I'm trying to ensure that. I can convey a message that an O'Toole government is going to responsibly phase out that government assistance, 
We have a job surge action plan that's going to address new hires, it's going to address issues relating to unemployment for six months or more to ensure that there is assistance. We are talking about assisting those, but we want to again move from, a, from an attitude of dependency to an attitude of pride in work and earning a paycheck. Brock points to other issues he would tackle if elected, including crime. Uh, Bradford has issues regarding homelessness. We have issues regarding addictions. We have issues regarding an increase, a significant increase in the uptick of crime, guns, gangs, illegal drugs. I can tell you with complete sincerity when I tell you this that the crime level that I've seen and the fear on the street is, is palpable. I think with an NDP government what you see is the opportunity to bring back hope because what they care about is what we care about. So what sort of things are you concerned about right now? With Adrian Roberts supports her party and its leader passionately and hopes she'll get a chance to prove herself in Ottawa with her commitment to the serious issues. So is it just the struggle of just not having enough income coming in? She does not think the so-called incumbent party effect, the fact that the riding has been conservative for the last 13 years, will hurt her chances. No, because if you look at our history, we've also had long-standing Liberal representation here and long-standing NDP representation here. You know, and an election is an opportunity for the community to really look at different platforms, look at their own needs. The pandemic has really affected people and different priorities now. So we're always, I'm not the judge, it's the people. They will decide. And I think this is part of that democratic process and having that opportunity to share our platform and share our vision as a new Democrat as what we can offer for this community and letting people cast their vote and letting them decide. Uh, well, first one would be 19, but I'm not sure anyone is home there, but we're going to start there and just grab I'll go check. Alison McDonald says she'll follow the approach she has always used in her working life in the campaign, and that is to be the hardest worker in the room. I'm Alison McDonald. I'm actually your Liberal candidate. She thinks this is a crucial election because the world is a different place thanks to the pandemic. Nobody has faced a pandemic before that I'm aware of. Yeah, I will work as hard as we can. I know we have a hard working team. I know we have a great platform. Hi. I don't, it's a, I think it's a fresh race. I've heard about you. I've heard a lot about you actually. Where I want to focus is inspiring people who haven't been voting to come out and vote because it's time, right? Everybody has experienced such a profound change in all of our lives, mm -hmm. kids, adults, mm -hmm. seniors, everyone. And I do believe that this riding can turn back red. In Brantford, Brant, I'm Pam Seidel for CPAC.